Imagine waking up one morning to find every satellite dead, every GPS offline, and communication networks worldwide not working. It's not science fiction. It's exactly the type of situation that scientists simulated in a full-scale solar superstorm drill. But there's an even more terrifying truth to a solar superstorm hitting Earth that we'll talk about at the end. I'm Ben, this is Physics or Bust. The European Space Agency, or ESA, just ran a massive space weather simulation. The goal? To test operational readiness for if a Carrington-class solar storm hit Earth today. In this drill, operators had to respond to cascading failures. GPS and communication systems failing all at once, satellites going offline, and power grids destabilizing. It was a coordinated stress test for satellites, related infrastructure, and how operators would respond to see how well our technology would survive the sun's next solar outburst. We'll dig into the physics in a minute, but first, if you like this video, you'd probably like this book. I've got a link in the description below. I do get a small commission, but it wouldn't cost you any extra. A solar storm hits Earth in three distinct phases each one on a different time scale, and each one doing very different physical damage. Understanding these three impacts is crucial, because the defenses and responses you use for one won't necessarily work for the others. The first wave to hit Earth will be the electromagnetic pulse. Light, x-rays, and extreme ultraviolet light, or EUVs, which will arrive in approximately eight minutes after the eruption. The first thing we'll feel is pure electromagnetic radiation with visible light, but more crucially with X-rays and EUVs. These waves travel at the speed of light, so there's effectively no warning system we could set up. Any warning system transmits its warning at the speed of light, and these waves are moving at that speed too. When this first wave hits, the X-rays and EUVs will suddenly increase ionization on Earth's day side at upper atmosphere, specifically the D and E layers of the ionosphere. The extra ionization absorbs and scatters high-frequency and very high-frequency radio waves, producing an almost instantaneous radio blackout for HF communications. That means pilots, shortwave operators, and any RF communications lose signal. Not because the hardware is fried, but because the propagation medium, the ionosphere, has changed. This is an instantaneous effect controlled by photochemistry and plasma physics. Photons hit air molecules ionize, radio paths disappear. There's basically no halfway with this. You either have resilient comms like fiber backups, or you don't. Next comes a torrent of charged particles, protons and heavy ions known as solar energetic particles, or SEPs. Their speeds can reach a large fraction of the speed of light, but they're slower than photons, so even for the most extreme events, their arrival is delayed by about 10 minutes, but that delay can be several hours or longer for many storms. But when this wave arrives, these charged particles will penetrate spacecraft shielding and the upper atmosphere. When they slam into the atmosphere, they cause enhanced ionization in the upper atmosphere and secondary particle showers that result in two major consequences. Radiation damage, including single event effects, because energetic protons can deposit enough energy on a microelectronic device to flip bits, corrupt memory, and even permanently damage components. So satellites would experience single event effects, while astronauts and high altitude crews would experience elevated radiation risk. The second major consequence is changes in atmospheric chemistry. Intense particle precipitation creates odd nitrogen oxides and other molecules that can disrupt ozone chemistry and modify ionospheric conductivity for days, if not longer. Only the highest energy particles reach low latitudes. The lower energy particles are either trapped or deflected by the magnetosphere. But any polar flights would be especially vulnerable to radiation exposure because the magnetosphere curves at the poles, allowing charged particles to penetrate deeper into the atmosphere, which is what creates the northern and southern lights. Finally, and most destructively for terrestrial infrastructure, the bulk plasma cloud of the CME arrives. Timing varies. Slow CMEs can take more than a day to arrive, but the fastest ones arrive in less than a day. The faster type is the event ESA's drill simulated. The CME compresses and distorts Earth's magnetosphere. If the CME's magnetic field is oriented opposite of Earth's, 
Magnetic reconnection on the day side of Earth opens large channels where solar plasma and energy flow into near-Earth space. That injected energy amplifies currents in the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. Crucially for power systems, these rapidly changing magnetic fields produce time-varying magnetic flux. By Faraday's law, changing flux induces voltages in long conductors, like transmission lines and pipelines. Those geomagnetically induced currents, or GICs, flow into transformer neutrals, driving half-cycle saturation of transformer cores. Saturated transformers heat, produce harmonics, lose reactive power capability, and can fail catastrophically. So you get three different physical mechanisms. Photons that instantly wreck HF radio by changing the ionosphere, relativistic particles that damage electronics and raise radiation risks, and then bulk plasma and magnetic storm dynamics that arrive hours, if not days later, that induce ground currents capable of destroying transformers and collapsing power grids. They're tied together. The same solar eruption spawns all three, but each requires different responses, mitigations, and forecasts. The good news? For the CME-driven GIC phase, you get some warning, hours, if not days so that there's at least a possibility of mobilizing crews to prep the grid for what you can do. The bad news? The EM and SEP phases give almost no time for doing anything. The ESA drill hopefully acts as a warning, not about space, but about our readiness. We can harden the grid, install automatic disconnect switches, shield satellites, and even build backup communication systems. But those investments are expensive, and until a disaster actually happens, it's real easy for governments to just ignore it. Now here's where it gets real unsettling. Earth's magnetic field isn't constant. Over the past 180 years, it's dropped in strength by about 9%. And it's not looking to stop dropping until we get to the full pole shift. And there's already one region called the South Atlantic Anomaly that has dropped strength dramatically. This weakening means that when a solar storm does hit, more charged particles are going to be able to penetrate deeper into the upper atmosphere. In other words, our shield is thinning, and could likely break if a big enough storm hit. So if a storm like the 1859 Carrington event did happen today, the effects would be even worse for multiple reasons. The effects would be magnified. Stronger induced currents, greater transformer overloads, and more widespread technological collapse. And that's exactly what the ESA's drill brought to my mind, and hopefully to the mind of a lot of others. Whether modern society could withstand a blow from the sun at the time that our defenses are waning. And we've already had a close call. In 2002, NASA's Stereo A satellite detected a CME the same level as the Carrington event. We just missed it by nine days. If it had hit power grids across multiple continents would have gone down simultaneously. NASA later called it a once-in-a-century storm that we barely avoided. When the Carrington event hit in 1859, telegraph systems sparked and caught fire, operators were shocked by their equipment, but that was a world lit mostly by candlelight, not electricity. Today, everything from farming, satellites, banking, vehicles, Everything depends on electrical systems. If a similar event happened now, high voltage transformers would burn out in seconds. Satellites would lose control or fry outright. GPS systems would completely go away. Even airplanes would lose their navigational data mid-flight. In fact, almost every electrical system would have some effect, with many of them being damaged beyond repair. And the scariest part? Beyond the fact that the electrical grid will take months, if not years, to fully repair, you can't even trust that backup generators would work because the electronics in them could be fried. And the fact is, physics doesn't care about your politics. The sun will erupt again, the magnetosphere will bend again, and the induced currents will flow wherever they can. The only real questions are these. Have we prepared enough? And will the next solar storm take us back more than 150 years in a single day? There's no quick reboot button for civilization. And it's not a question of if it's going to happen. It's a question of when. So what kind of things have you guys done to prepare for a situation similar to this? Let me know in the comments below. 
For more space and science news and updates, remember to like and subscribe. And to help this channel grow and get this message out to more people, click in this video right here, and I'll see you there. I hope you guys have a great day, and remember, keep asking questions. I'll see you on the next video.